You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. I'm joined by Brad Hunt, and today's podcast is with Jay Scott from Jay Scott Outdoors. Jay was the individual who who uh, got us set up with our trip to Mexico for our coos deer hunt. Yep. He has been around forever, uh, and uh, he's one of the first podcasts that was in the hunting space. Yeah. Like, he was an OG. Right. I was right there on his heels. You and or him and, and you and Cody think, Rich. and Renella. So, he's been around for quite a long time, and uh, he's run a, a, a superb outfit across the board. He guides all over um, Arizona and Mexico. Yeah. And we stumbled into the, the opportunity to go to Mexico. We did a podcast with Jay a couple months ago before we left on the mm-hmm. coos deer hunt. So for those that have been watching the coos deer hunting films, you know what we're talking about, or if you tuned into an early podcast. Um, so this is my follow-up interview with Jay Scott after returning from Mexico, after dropping, I think, three films. Three films at that time, yeah. At that time. To get his uh, his take on, uh, on my thoughts on coos deer hunting, his thoughts, kind of us sharing our experiences, what we think about coos deer hunts. Ryan Lampers is on the podcast mm-hmm. with it's the three of us just kind of talking about uh, Mexico and this hunt and coos deer. So if you're ever interested in this hunt, it's 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 quite affordable when you stack it up against all the other kind of hunts out there. Yeah. It's quite the epic adventure. Uh, in the end, I think it's um. I think it's special. And I you mean, can make it whatever adventure. Like if you, you're not mm-hmm. into hiking a bunch, I mean, there's opportunity to zoom around on roads side by side. Yeah. And, or if you want to get remote, you can. And we're, we're so freedom oriented and DIY that all we did was have a fixer help us get through the border. Yeah. And then a car escort us. Dry, like we followed tailgate. To the area we needed to go. Uh, and uh, to, a, to a place we were going. Yep. And then uh, once we got there, we drove 17 or 20 miles on yeah. the worst Nasty. sketchiest dirt road you have ever seen. I wouldn't even call it a road no. to get back to this place. And then we had vast tracks of what I would classify as wilderness. Yeah. And oh, absolutely. just that's it to ourselves. Wild, wild ass North yeah, desert. There wilderness. are many places that we went, like when Hunter and I went and hiked back in there, you guys hiked in and it was like, has anyone ever been here? Has a, has a cowboy been here? I know where Ryan <laughs> shot his buck. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if anybody has, hunted that particular spot ever or in, right. in years like I feel, generations I feel most guys are because there's roads there but there are these places roads. yeah roads i like if you had a truck you'd i don't know it's a horse trail <laughs> yeah they're bad you'd be hosed they're bad but it's like has anybody ever gone 500 yards off of that yeah. road you know so this know. interview with jay is is great for that i also put a lot of research post hunt and into the films where I would talk about coos deer behavior, rutting behavior, uh, you know, marking territory, Mm -hmm. how they blow when they rut, things like that. Throwing that against Jay, who has been pursuing and guiding and outfitting for coos deer for, for between Arizona and Mexico for, for generations. And I wanted to know what he thought about the research I had done that I put into the film compared to his own, Experience. experiences and um with some minor tweaks here and there it was pretty spot on so i think it's a great conversation i think you're going to enjoy it if you want to support what we do you can do that in a number of ways one is uh if you want to join brian lampers myself and brad in june june 15th to the 18th you can sign up for the western hunting summit for the elk summit yeah there's a few spots available it's been sold out but then there's always people who have to reschedule for reschedule next year. and and so some spots have opened up and you can get on you can get on over there and sign up go to Western Hunting Summit dot com yeah, correct and you can sign up over there and that helps that helps Ryan and Hillary uh, it, you don't want to miss it it's great if you have the finances and and you have the time it's an incredible um, weekend yeah, you got um, guys like Brian Barney Joel Turner will be there teaching his shot IQ stuff you have Tom Schneider from Stuck, Stuck in the, in the Rut. Rut. So, I mean, we'll be there, uh, get to shoot with us, get to hang out. Yep. It's a, it's a great event. And then if you want to join our gritty stealthy community where we do live streams and we drop bonus content, you can go over there. In fact, over there, you'll see a bonus film that Brad put together that shows some behind the scenes 
coos deer hunting content, mm -hmm. uh, scenes inside the Hacienda, Hacienda. Uh, scenes with our um, Enrique, our Mexican friends. Brian's um, relationship with the beans <laughs> we beans, ate there. <laughs> uh, some little side-by-side -side yeah. actions, some some off-roading that we did, all of that kind of stuff. It's in a, in a bonus film over there. Yep. For seven bucks, you can sign up just for 30 days, see what you think. It's $7 a month after that as well. And it's just a pl another place where we can throw up some content that's exclusive, yep. but we'll always keep bringing free content here uh, on YouTube and uh, on Spotify for those that are listening to podcasts. We're also working on a Rumble channel, so yeah. we're hoping you guys can start checking out our stuff on Rumble as well as YouTube's kind of communist. So that's uh, <laughs> that's where we're at right yeah. now. So I hope you're enjoying this, the content we're dropping. Uh, uh, always check out the description fields in the below. You can always shop at Stealthy, get rifle cover glassing pad, go to Mountain Ops, get some supplements, go to Stealthy, get some gut health supplements, all that stuff helps us out. We appreciate you tuning in. And uh, don't forget about our films. If you haven't seen our Kuzier films, go check them out. They're well worth the time, I think, yep. to sit down and watch them with some family, um, put them on number. the big screen in 4k yeah. and just, uh, sit back and go on a hunt with us. Yeah. I think it's well worth, uh, the time. It's a, it's a, uh, they're, I put a lot of work into those films. Yeah. So episode five, this Sunday, episode five, this yeah. Sunday, you don't want to miss that one. That's where the big kahuna is, uh, taken. I take full responsibility for that. <laughs> Buck. No, <laughs> Brad saw him for You're two and, welcome, and a half Ryan miles. Lampers. I saw him the day, uh, yeah, we we outspotted Ryan on this trip. Yeah, across the board. Technically, I spotted the biggest deer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, thank you for tuning in. Enjoy this episode, and we'll see you on the next one. Stay gritty. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, and today my guests are Ryan Lampers and Jay Scott. And uh, I, our subject today is going to be coos deer, and we. We have recently returned from our hunt uh, that we did with you, Jay, where you set us up for a DIY uh, coos deer hunt in Mexico. We have uh, we recorded a podcast before we left with you and folks that are interested in uh, the topic. They can go check out that earlier podcast. Now we're going to do a little post hunt podcast with you and sort sort of. Uh, talk about our experience, ask you some follow-up questions. We have a lot, I think, that uh, comes to mind. So with that, we're going we're gonna to roll right into some questions. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, for, let's say people are listening right now, and, and one of their questions is going to be, you know, how was the trip, Brian? Because going to Mexico, we just, we hear scary, scary stories about going to Mexico. What some, so just, just the other day in the news, we heard some some pretty weird cartel kind of stuff going on down there. So uh, we did the hunt though, and it actually turned out to be very smooth. And you've been doing this going to Mexico for how many years now? So this January I finished my 27th season consecutively doing exactly what you just did. Wow. And every year you've, you set up a number of hunters to go down there. So far, how many have been shot by the cartel? None that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that we hear about in, in our media. And, and I think it, it, there's no denying that, you know, stuff goes on there in other countries that, uh, you know, we probably uh, are a little bit sheltered here in the U.S. But, I mean, we hear about these things. And then we had this incident last week. Um, some people went down, it sounds like, and got tangled up with the wrong people and uh, it sounds like it was a case of mistaken identity they were mistaken for haitian drug dealers i believe if you read the cases of the, the facts of the story i believe all of the people involved actually had their own rap sheets had you know um different connections with drugs and drug abuse and drug sales and so you know, I, I don't know. I just read what everybody else reads, but I, I've got to believe there's more to that story. Um, you know, safety is always a number one concern for us. My biggest thing is wanting to, people to enjoy Mexico like I have enjoyed it the last 27 seasons. You know, and, and I talk to hunters. I've got Gould's turkey hunts here kicking off this next month. And, um, you know, with this recent incident, people are asking me all kinds of questions. And, 
you know, not to belittle what happened down there or anything, because really I just read what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. Um, But the reality is Mexico is a giant place. The U.S. is a giant place. If you're in Cincinnati, Ohio, and a, a murder takes place in Los Angeles, does that necessarily mean that you, you know, don't want people traveling in to visit you in Cincinnati, Ohio? Yeah. Um, meaning it's you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand miles away, and it's an unfortunate incident. And the other point with that is like, you know, how many murders go untold on the media every day here in the United States? But we have one incident in Mexico and, you know, it becomes topic of, you know, political headlines. It, it, it becomes, you know, the, the, uh, on the front of the Fox news on the CNN on, you know, MSNBC, whatever it may be. Um, and it's unfortunate and it's unfortunate for the victims of, of whatever happened and, and however that shook out. But, you know, my goal is always to try and provide a safe environment for the hunters um, you know, with our escorts that we have that you guys had that took you from, you know, the border to the ranch, you know, these are people that live in the country. These are people that speak the language. Um, and, and, you know, we also follow some guidelines of, you know, travel during the day, don't travel at night. Um, you know, don't go to, you know, the nightclubs, don't go, you know, to the cities at night and, and go to bars and do things where maybe you're going to put yourself in a situation of harm, much like, you know, if you were visiting a friend in Atlanta, you know, probably, you know, after dinner, you'd probably go home. You, you know, if, if you tend to go out to those places where maybe trouble might be lurking around, you're going to potentially find it. So, um, you know, safety is always a number one concern of ours. And it's, we have such great contacts down there and we've kind of been doing our little system of, of getting from point A to point B. And we've never had any incidences. Um, and it's, you know, when you get on the ranch, like what you guys witnessed, you're in the middle. It's probably one of the most remote places you guys have been. I mean, it's, you're in the absolute middle of nowhere. There's no one else around, maybe a few cows, maybe a few horses, you know, and nothing yeah. but, but, you know, just just this beautiful area. So I want people to be able to encounter what you guys saw. And I've really enjoyed the first three episodes. Um, I think you guys have done an amazing job of like showing the landscape, showing how difficult coos deer can be from the fact of, you know, they bed up and maybe you don't see them for a full day and they're gone. And then maybe the next day they're running around like crazy. So how do you go from one, one, a uh, way of them being totally disconnected from you and they're bedded down and you think there's not a deer on the whole ranch to deer rutting and chasing and uh, bucks blowing at each other. Um, and, and I've never been able to years ago, 15 years ago or so, Steve Chapel and I did a, it's, it's called extreme coups. And I, at the time, I think it was one of the first uh, coups videos and one of the things we were never able to capture is like the true bucks rutting, bucks chasing, because we didn't have the equipment right. like that big long lens that you had where you were able to stay on the buck and kind of watch his behavior, watch him rubbing his back legs together, watching him rake in trees, you know, going and, and chasing other bucks off and then coming back, finding his doe, chasing the doe around, then, you know, it, it, it's mad so far chaos. yeah it and, and i always tell people they're like well when do you want to go down i said well the peak of the rut is really hard to beat but trying to kill a deer a buck that you've found that is rutting does is very difficult because of just what you guys were able to capture brian on your hunt was the fact that the buck is moving around. He never, literally never stops to give you a shot. And one of the hardest things when hunting, rutting coos deer is once they get on their feet, they seem to never stop. And so many times I've had bucks, you know, just like that situation and boom, they go off down the ridge and, you know, off in a never, never land. And then two hours later, boom, here they come right back again. I thought on this last episode where, well, for, for those of you that haven't seen it, you need to go back and watch one, two, and three. But 
in essence, you guys found this buck early, maybe on day one. Yep. And, and then you didn't kill him till many days later. But one of the things that I thought you guys did so well of is you were able to say, you know what, this buck is working a certain territory. And we know that he's going to circle around and likely if he doesn't you know, go off chasing another doe and go a mile away, he's going to be right in this country. So I thought you guys, you know, as, as guys that are cutting their teeth on hunting coos, they're obviously very experienced in other animals, but you did a really good thing in that you positioned yourself where that buck was going to make his scrapes and kind of stay in that core area. And as, as the video showed, it paid off um, where you guys were able to be in a sniper position and just wait for that buck in essence to make a mistake. Yeah, it was, uh, th it's very, I, if, if we didn't have the elevated position as well, and, and sometimes we found bucks, for example, in Arizona where the, the terrain is, is much flatter and you don't have that steep, like straight down bluff where you can get like 200 yards from the animal and also have you know a an 800 yard left to right panoramic panoramic yeah. shot you know so a lot of times when they run like that in arizona it's it's hard because they you you don't first of all it's generally not rifle when they do that uh, it's a bow season and right. and so that's tough but then in addition to that um, sometimes that terrain is a little more gradual and rolling and we were able to keep eyes on the buck cause we were so high because yeah. he, he ran here, ran here, ran here, ran here, you know, and, and we were able to film the whole thing cause of our elevation, but Brad and Hunter were in another area and they had the opposite pro they had a, you know, they didn't have that advantage when we got on Ryan's buck, which is just a true giant. Um, the same thing, we were able to get that elevation and keep it, which allowed us to actually observe the animal in a way that if we were in a spot with less mountainous country would have been difficult. Yeah. You know, I, I try and help people when they ask me questions about coos deer hunting. And I always say, go as high as you can look down and across. Cause when you look down and across, you typically are above the, the, the elevation of the vegetation. Yeah. So you can now be looking down into it rather than up. Because if you take your angles, if you're looking up, you're basically catching them because you know how they're so little, you're catching them from about mid body and up. If you're above them, then you can have that full angle where you can see, you know, even their legs and, and yes. see their whole body. Um, so I always try and encourage people to try and get as high as you can get up on a rock perch like what i saw in the videos where a lot of times you guys were glassing where there was a rock pinnacle where you could kind of see as wide a field of view as possible to catch as much country but also have that angle down and across um is key when you're down low and looking up it just it's it's a real challenge to kind of keep track because the grass is so high the brush to even find those deer so I thought you guys did a really good job, um, kind of showing, you know, the struggles. I think some videos that we've seen in the past on coos, it just kind of shows up. We're glassing, we found a buck and we killed it. I kind of liked how you showed the struggle because I always feel like after a seven day hunt in Mexico, people see the success and they see the photos and they think it was just easy. As you guys know, it's not easy. And there's a lot of time when you're struggling. Um, but in order to, to, to efficiently hunt these deer, I think you've got to get on those pinnacles and you've got to take your lumps when, when they're not moving. Um, and you, I mean, you guys captured it so far as good as any coos video I've ever seen. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We, we use that same tactic. Um, on a lot of hunts, we use it for bears, uh, not necessarily as important for bears. They just jump out that time of year, but for mule deer, especially, sure. you know, Brian and I will grab these vantages that, that see large swaths of country and it gives us a better play being up on a ridge like that. You can go right, left, you know, depending on which way the animal's moving, but I don't think there's an animal that it's, that it's more important to do that with than a coos, because like you said, Jay, the grass. Um, this was a kind of a wet year. I feel like the grass was maybe a little extra tall, right? 
We've sure. seen that in Arizona. There's years where it's hardly anything and everything pops. And then a year like this where literally those deer just disappear. Um, and oftentimes they'll lay down and, and we find them in that yellow grass a lot. For some reason, we, we tend to, it's one of the areas you can glass, so it's good, but we just tend to find them. It's kind of like this little home base, those yellow grass patches and uh they just disappear so having that elevation allows you to look down and it's it's a really big advantage and that's kind of been my uh brian and i's playbook uh even on the arizona side uh is grabbing those those high peaks and areas where we can look down it's been really effective so far yeah for sure i mean most mornings i find myself hiking with a headlamp get up in into those you know, pinnacles and, and high, high points or ridges where I've gained an, uh, an optical advantage. Um, and, and I take that into sheep hunting, mule deer hunting, elk hunting. I always try and gain the optical advantage where trying to stack everything in my favor, where I have the advantage to be able to see them, um, mm -hmm. you know, almost take it to a military, you know, kind of mindset of like, strategically, you want to have the advantage and you want to set those advantages in your favor as much as possible. And, and by getting that altitude advantage and looking down and across with coos, and I've found with most every other animal works, um, you know, I would see with bears, how it could work sheep, you know, elk. Um, but if, if people would try and gain that altitude advantage and get out on a rock point where they, you know, increase the amount of country they can see, I think they're going to see more, uh, for sure. Yeah, we've always, we've used the same line many times. It's, uh, you know, if things aren't working out, just go higher. And so it just tends to open up more space. Um, so Jay, you mentioned you, you, uh, you tend to get up, you're running probably the red light, grabbing these perches early. Um, I'm curious, you know, Brian and I, when we were down there, we were hunting, we were hunting the rut and we noticed that a lot of the activity there's a couple of days where we'd see them like first thing in the morning, but oftentimes we'd get up there and there'd be a couple hours in the morning where we really didn't see much movement. Uh, we've seen that in Arizona as well, but we're typically hunting the rut. So activity was like peaking between nine and noon, maybe nine and 11, somewhere in that time frame. Is that the case when the rut is not going on? Is no. it just a coos deer thing or is that more of a, a rut? No. So I always say that it's temperature related. Um, once you guys got those deer on the ground, you were able to really feel their hide, how, how thin their hide is. And they, you know, they don't have the big thick coats like the elk or the mule deer. They're very thin skinned. And so what I always say is that when it's cold and, and you guys, I saw were maybe had a puffy on, but a lot of times you didn't even have a puffy on, but for them, that's still cold because, you know, 11 months out of the year, it's 80, 90, 100 degrees. So when you start getting, you know, 30s and 40s as your low, those deer, in my opinion, they stay down because they are conserving energy. Unlike their cousins back in the Midwest or East, when guys say, oh, there's a big cold front and the deer are really going to be moving. Coos are the exact opposite. They have thin skin, so they are going to lay down until it warms up. So typically uh on the early hunts when they're not rutting you're going to be hunting them in warmer temperatures so the first light and last light are really the only times that you will see them during the daylight when it's rut time it's january and it's typically you know been in the 20s or 30s and then it quickly warms up but those deer lay down and stay down they also stay down because of predators um, mm -hmm. they, they want to stay put. They want to be tucked in like a, you know, a covey of quail and then get where they can see. And so a lot of times, and it becomes eight, nine o'clock in the morning, um, before they even start moving. So I think it's a temperature, uh, mm -hmm. a, a temperature deal. And I think it's a, you know, they're, they're protecting themselves as well and not being out in that low light condition and, and, we see it all the time. I mean, the, the prime time we always tease, we're like, we get up and we get up there, you know, during the rut, we get on these points and we sit there for an hour and a half and freeze to death. And the deer don't even get up till nine o'clock. I mean, it, it's historically, 
you know, if you just woke up, had breakfast and got out there about an hour after the sun, you probably would not miss much. Um, the only thing that would change that is if, if the weather was not cold in the morning and let's say that maybe the lows were only in the mid forties to fifties, then I think it would change a little bit and you would have that first light activity and then they would lay down. I think you guys had a couple of days where it kind of got warm during the day and, and you, you probably noticed once they were kind of down, they were down. Now, if they're, I think I saw some footage too, where they were like really chasing and rutting and it seemed like it was right during the middle of the day. So once they really get chasing, they kind of throw their own wanting to stay cool away and just run right out in the middle of the sunshine. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause me and Brian were joking because I really enjoy the cooler weather. Like I love living in a puffy jacket. I guess it's a sure. major, but I felt like, man, this is, this is perfect conditions. We got cool temps, you know? Um, but I guess it's the opposite. Brian was hoping for like, 90 degree days <laughs> i was pretty happy with these like barely breaking 50 type days but you're right we we weren't noticing a lot of activity on those cooler days we had one day where it was kind of real it was blustery and cooler and it was probably our worst day well the the thing with that um ryan in my opinion you get any coups are very finicky with any kind of wind chop at all they like dead calm. If you get the windy, choppy, the grass, think of it from their perspective. Those lions and, and, and coyotes are after them at all times, and they're not very big, and they're constantly getting chased. So if now they're laying there, standing there, and the brush is ticking, and you know, yeah. you know, and, and they can't hear as well. If you, I, you caught some footage, and I don't even know if you guys realized you caught it, but did you notice how you would be zoomed in on those deer, whether bucks or does? And their head, they're just looking around. Their ears are just moving. They're constantly aware of their surroundings. So, you know, I always tell people the ideal situation for me is, is consistent, you know, cool in the morning, sunny, consistent, high pressure. That's what I would prefer to hunt because the deer are not, um, when they get on edge, they're going to just lay down and stay bedded. I mean, it is not uncommon to have a windy day and literally go on a ranch where you see 30 deer in a day and see one or two. And they get mm -hmm. up for just a second and bed right back down because they don't like the wind. Coos are very, yeah. you know, we're like, I've seen mule deer, elk, sheep standing out in the middle of a 30 mile an hour gust, just standing in it like it's nothing. Coos yeah. deer are very finicky um, <clears throat> animals. That makes sense. It, it it seems as if in their mannerisms, they um they're always acting as if something's about to pounce on them. Like they yeah. are so on edge all the time. And um, one thing I noticed is, you know, I love it when a, a big old muley buck will just statue up and just you know let the danger walk by, or they're just focused on something. They hurt something, but. It seems as if coos deer are even more so apt to when something doesn't feel right, they will stand statue for 30 minutes and not even move a muscle. It's crazy how long and um, which is probably why we, we miss a lot when we're glassing. They may have just been in the shadows and just behind a tree. And, and when they statue up so dead still like they can, um, I could easily see how you could scan a hillside and just never know that big buck was standing there for sure. Yeah. I've <laughs> noticed over the years, uh, the first time I hunted coos was with Randy Newberg and we were in Arizona and, and, uh, there was a string of windy days and we were seeing 30, 40 deer a day. And then on those windy days, we saw zero or one same spot. You know, I knew there were deer there cause we'd been hunting them for three or four days and, they were rutting hard the day before it didn't just stop but that wind man a little wind and they were done they were yeah. done I, and, I would rather have sorry brian i would rather have a bunch of wind rather than a little bit of wind because at least if you've got a real steady wind you know say you know 10 15 20 miles an hour they're going to be on the lee side of the hill yeah. so you can actually get with the wind in your face and pick into those hillsides where they're they're out of the wind it's when you have that 
you know, just little bit of wind chop that there's no consistency. There's no rhyme or reason to where they'll be. If it really starts blowing from one direction, they're just going to roll over the top of a hill and get on that right. lee side. And then it actually, they become a lot more predictable. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the situation I'm editing right now. Um, uh, the stock on Ryan's buck and the wind's pretty hard in our face. I'm trying to get the audio to work because the microphones were hit, getting slapped by the wind constantly. It's really bad audio, but they are, they are tucked in that little bowl with that steady wind in one direction. It's pretty heavy wind, but they aren't feeling the wind where they're at. Right. And they are very active, very comfortable. You can see a little bit of wind blow, but I'll tell you, um, when we were watching Ryan's buck, there was this one moment. So this, this buck is old and he isn't chasing the doe. She wants him to chase her. She's trying to get him to chase her, but he just always sort of, it was really fascinating to watch. He, he would just kind of get close and then he'd lay down near her and he'd never pushed her too, too hard at all. And then she'd sort of do this coy sort of behavior and he just wouldn't quite go for it all the way and uh <clears throat> she ends up going a little further away than he wants he keeps trying to push her back into the bowl and she's climbing the ridge and she's getting ready to go out of the basin and ryan and i are thinking maybe our dreams are shattered forever you know <laughs> we're hoping this buck actually has a pocket and he's going to stay in it but he gets to the ridge and he gets to the top and his behavior completely kind of shifts. You know, he's just kind of patiently waiting for her and kind of flirting and whatever, and just kind of being real gentle. And this, this doe though is trying to get him riled up, you know, and she gets, she starts going up out and he's herded her down a number of times, cut up in front of her and got over the top. But every time he tries to cut her off, she tries to get past him just, just to, just to, you know, you can just see just to sort of, you know, see how far he'll push, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and she goes up over the rim a little bit out of the basin where the wind is pretty choppy and you could tell away from where all the deer were all pocketed and he gets pissed. Like you can visibly see his agitation and he gets on this thing and he doesn't, he gets near her and he just starts stomping his leg, mm -hmm. just over. probably one leg, the front, one leg, front leg, just, he does yeah. his left front leg like 10 times and he's just like looking around alert and, and it, you can see, he's like, we need to get the hell out of here. Like, this is far enough. I'm, he's like, lady, this is, this, this isn't, is, this isn't going to fly. This isn't going to get us killed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And he's doing the right, the left leg. Then he switches and does it 10 times on his other leg. Like the left got too tired. And sure enough, like right after that, you could see she's kind of like, okay. And she comes rolling down the hill and gets into the, into the pocket again. And then everything was his body language, all the behavior kind of changed again. But it was really fascinating to see. You could see he's old. He didn't want to go very far from his familiar territory. And he wasn't going to put up with her crap. You know, he's like, I'm indulging you to a point, but here is, he's warning her. You could just see it. You know, the agitation was level 100 all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, it, you know, you guys having that great lens and, and it seemed like from my perspective as a viewer, it seemed like you were in observation mode so far in the first three episodes. In other words, it wasn't like, oh, there's a buck. We got to kill him now. I love the fact that you were able to capture a lot of the deer's behavior. So I'm excited to see because I've seen it for, you know, 27 years in Mexico, but before that hunt in Arizona, watching these deer. And I've always been in all the animals that I hunt. I've always been one that kind of is fascinated by their behavior and by their body language and try to pay attention to certain things like what you're describing. And, and I just feel like coos because they're a small animal the the videography has not been captured like what you guys were able to get. So kudos to you guys for actually like really taking the time 
to make these episodes, you know, 30, 35 minutes or however <clears throat> long they are and not just a there's a deer boom shot them because there's so much more to it, in my opinion, as someone that loves coups is like th- that behavior that you were able to just witness is like priceless to me to see a buck stomping his feet. He might have even if you were close enough, you might even have been able to hear him snorting or grunting at her like, yeah you know, get back over here. You know, I'm not going to come chase you over that ridge. And, um, so from a coos deer lover, like myself, seeing the amount of quality footage that you were actually able to get was awesome. Um, so I'm excited to see, uh, Ryan's, you know, hunt unfold. You know, what's interesting, Jay is, um, I never would have thought this before I started hunting with Brian, but, uh, I've been hunting my whole life and been behind the glass my whole life and yet i never picked up a lot of what we now pick up with the lens because we're able to go back a lot of these things that that you witness on a on a video we don't even see them until after like we get home and and brian will send me something like wow look at this you know like we caught this and didn't even know it and you're behind a spotter and behind the binos but when that long lens is um, is capturing it, and you can go back, and you know you noticed on the first episode, Brian mentioned, you know, we think this is a good buck, but we'll really know when we get back. We and zoom we in on, pick it. through this, and zoom in, and and really pick up some details. And that's when, especially for coos, coos are so small. You know, we we have the luxury of going back and and picking up like, holy smokes, he's got stickers and his his brows have some crud here and things like that. And it's, it's obviously not just coos deer. We see that on mule deer and we pick up bears doing these really unique things that, that you just don't pick up when you're on the mountain hunting them. So, um, yeah, it's true. having Brian pack a big, heavy camera lens around. I mean, it's kind of nice. For, it's uh, it's perfect. Here. You know, when, <laughs> when that, on the first episode, when that first buck appeared, when Ryan's buck appeared and he came out and you guys are kind of what I would call like kind of dilly dally and like mm-hmm. back and forth with each other. Well, is it, I'm sitting there looking at it going, what are you guys? <laughs> this fuck is a great buck. Like, and, and obviously Ryan, you go and shoot a buck even bigger, but like there comes a point for me when they get around that 107, 108 inches and up that all of a sudden they kind of are, it, 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 curious your thoughts but they kind of get in a uh a category of their own there's kind of like ah it's bucks and then they get that frame they get those beams wrapping they get that mass and you're like this it's a totally different level of buck much like a mule deer you know when you see one with big heavy bases and he's got a lot of mass you're like this is a whole nother level of buck but um yeah when i first saw that buck come out and i think he turned at the camera and looked dead at it i was like oh my gosh if they don't shoot this deer holy smoke and i think jay um it, if if we would have like caught that glance on day four or five or six both brian and i would have been in agreement we're like oh that's a buck we gotta go for right now <laughs> it just when it's day one first morning it's totally you're, you're looking for reasons not to go shoot it like sure you Man, want the hunt to last as long as possible. And yeah. they're like, we just got here. We've got, you know, a week or 10 days. Like we don't, we don't want the hunt to be over. Right. And then you're thinking in your mind, well, maybe this is just a mid tier buck and maybe there's, yeah. you know, four or five lampers bucks running around. <laughs> you, you never yeah. know. And, but totally. I think that's something we, as hunters in no matter what we're hunting, the first day is always a challenge because it's like how many times. I've, I've had it happen so many times where the best buck or best bull or best ram of the whole trip is on the first day. So it's like, how that happens so often. I had, and then there's this, there's days worth of like, man, did we really screw up or what? Because we're not seeing anything better. But I think that's a great thing to have the ability to see something like I could tell you guys were most people would have spotted that buck and been in full panic mode to try and kill that deer. I loved, and and I don't know if it's just that's your style because it's kind of my style, just taking it all in, not in a rush, not in a hurry. Obviously, if 
you know, that non-typical buck we killed a few years ago that you flashed on the screen pops up, you're probably going to all freak out like we all would. But, but I like how you guys are able to kind of just disseminate, like, just take it in, you know, just check it out, not get too excited and just be like, yeah, this is a really good buck. It's the first day, you know, we're kind of, and then maybe you win a day or two and, and you're like, let's go back and try and find that buck again. Cause I think it's a pretty good buck. Well, it's, a, I, it's definitely a topic of conversation that's been discussed a lot through these <laughs> films, but honestly, I think our 20 and 30 year old selves would have zipped right in and tried to take sure. that buck down. But our 40 year old selves, um, you know, we're not just there to take a good buck. We're, we want, we want to Full max thing. this thing out. We want to see it all. We've got, sure. we want animals to see, and we want to re- see the potential of this place before we just make a rash decision and go fill a tag. It's, well, it's the case <clears throat> with all of our hunts these days from mule deer and to bear. And, you know, we've shown it. We've made some mistakes too, where we didn't see bucks of better quality than the ones we saw on day one. But that's a that's a good problem. I mean, that's not something I regret. It's it's I don't regret um, shooting day one when you know most of these trips we're extending it out to the very end, and we're we're getting a better hunt for it by doing that. So I know there's always going to be folks that are like, oh, you, you know, don't pass on the first day what you shoot on the last, but um, we're to the mindset now or the point in our hunting careers, I guess, where it's just not the case, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll go home without a tag filled if that's, but at least I maxed it out and I got enjoyment out of 10 days. I think it's a, you know, I always say it's like a hunter maturity stage. Like we're early on, you're just trying to, you know, whack them and stack them and that's perfectly fine. And then it seems as though, you know, the more experiences you get, maybe the older you get, the more, you know more experience you have hunting the more you like being out there the more you're like let's just let it roll i'm gonna let that buck walk maybe it's a mistake but maybe it's not and you never know till you go to the very end i mean most of the time i go to the very end of the hunt and i'll either shoot or not get anything but likely by by holding off i end up finding something bigger sometimes i don't but most of the time I find something more mature. I find something heavier. I find something bigger. And man, instead of being done day one, I'm done day 10 and Mm -hmm. I've passed 30 or 40 bucks and then found this one great buck. So, you know, I think everyone comes uh, with their own level of, you know, expertise. They come with their own level of experiences, but you mature to a point where you, you want to encounter it all. And yeah. if, if you are okay with going home without one, that's where I've found it's the best place to be. If, if you know that it's a great hunt and you don't have to kill, I enjoy the hunt more with that mentality than feeling like I have to, to, to actually kill something. Yeah. I think yeah, that there, I, are, there are a lot of people who experience, like Ryan said, he said it perfectly. When we were in our twenties, I would have been very excited to shoot nearly any uh you know semi you know any 90 inch buck running around i've been like oh yeah but uh, as i've gotten older and done more and it's not lost on me how blessed i am how many hunts i get to be on how much opportunity i have but with that comes um a desire to experience something different than what i did in the past which means i'll typically not be excited by something um, that would have excited me 15, 20 years ago, just doesn't, doesn't fulfill me anymore in the same way. So I'm perfectly content with waiting. It, it's not a struggle, actually. I, I, I enjoy the challenge, but I have a lot of people watching the show, right? Coming at this from a, from where I would have 20, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And they're saying, what are you thinking? What are you like? You're nuts. I don't get it. You know? And which is perfectly okay. That's they're at a they're at a, a different stage, you know, sure. of uh, yeah. of desire and and yeah. and I think I've seen people kind of come and go throughout the different stages and maybe revert back and then you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's opportunity for people to be at different standpoints or different levels 
you know, throughout their hunting spectrum and it can come and go, come and go. Um, but think of from a filming perspective and what you guys by, by not shooting on day one, look at all of the actual quality footage of that buck that you were able to get for this film. It, it's, it, it made the, (laughs) it made the first three episodes in my mind of not shooting on day one and getting to actually that some of that footage, I don't know if you realize it's some of the best natural coos deer buck in their environment video i believe ever captured as someone that's you know studied and loved these deer for a long time there's a lot of things when you i mean i've gone back and watched the episodes multiple times just to see the buck move see what the buck is doing how he's reacting and so that was really cool i'm excited for the next few episodes but you know the the capturing the heat waves are rough and so it is, is the, yeah. the harsh sunlight. So it is really difficult to capture coos deer footage because heat waves at distance are the ultimate enemy of film. Sure. And then you add the harsh sunlight to it as well. And you have to do so much to try to make it so that it actually has some color and you can actually see it, you know, without right. darkening. It's not all image. whited out and stuff. Yeah, it's really hard. And so messing with the footage at home was was uh has been challenging more so than most of our hunts when we do a late season mule deer hunt and it's super cold i got no heat waves sure you know i mean it's just easy to film crisp sharp from way more distance i can get the footage to look good with the coups we had to try to get pretty close to be able to salvage it after the heat waves did their damage but i'll say that i'm just um, i'm just gonna take credit for all that brian because uh, my camera skills are just at that level you know you're Ryan, your next was unmatched. Ryan was incredible. <laughs> like I will say, here's what I've noticed is that I've come mm. across a lot of cameramen with long lenses that, that uh, aren't very good with the lens. And what I have discovered is hunters who have spent their lifetime looking through spotters are way better at filming with long lenses than cameramen are. Sure. And so lampers can spot the animal and put it in the scope in a way that um, just regular camera guys struggle the, right like the connection they just they're not uh skilled at it and then tracking it moving the the tripod that's a skill that has been developed through using a spotter for so many years that just translates into the long lens perfectly yeah well i mean i let's think be honest like, though i all i had to do jay was follow that thing around i mean once you after you turn it on i have no idea how yeah, cameras work but whatsoever but let's let's admit like, they're you know <laughs> <laughs> that's true, but there you go. that's not usually the problem when I hand the camera over to somebody. The problem is it's a ghost, a little dot, yeah. and you take your eyes off of it for one second and it's gone. And yeah. and that keeping that thing in the frame at that distance and tracking it and not losing it, that is a feat. And Ryan, Ryan's just really adept at that. Well, I think it's a skill that a lot of people need to to practice. Um, obviously, Ryan's done it his whole life where you're looking through a spotting scope. A lot of people just look through the spotting scope, but then they don't step back and go, where is that in relation to where I'm looking on this broad landscape? And he probably has trained his eye that the big white rock or the dead white oak tree or the pine the pine tree with the big limb on the left side that has orange branches where when he's looking through the spotting scope boom he's zoomed in and he sees it but he can also lift his eye out and know where on that hillside whatever he's looking at you know he's been used to looking at mule deer and bears and he probably has trained himself like we all try to do. And I would encourage anybody listening is when you go out in glass, practice it, practice zooming in on it, but then pull out of your spotting scope and actually try and acclimate. Where is that animal in relation? Okay. There he is. Okay. Pull out and be like, okay. That's a great point, Jay. Cause we're actually doing that when we don't see animals. Like sure. uh, Ryan and I, I know like myself, I'm looking at the hillside and I might, we might be glassing that spot for two hours, but in the first five minutes, I'm like with my naked eye between, I'm creating a relationship between the long lens and the, and the optics and the, the, the landscape. And I'm going, sure. okay, there's a white rock there. There's a hill here. And I, so when I do see something and I'm going like this, 
and I do see it, I can quickly go, oh yeah, that's where it's at. Cause I've right. already married the two together, the, the close range and the broad range. Cause I've been sure. mentally taking that picture all morning so that in the case, cause I, when I was younger, I did what you just said. I just looked here the whole time. And then I'd spot it and then you'd spend 15 minutes trying to figure right. out where it is in relation to the optic. Well, it's funny. I think we've all hunted with um, folks in the past where they're terrible, absolutely terrible at telling you where the whatever it is they're looking at is on the mountain. They're like in the trees to the right <laughs> of the trees. You're like, there's trees yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Which, Which rock tree? are you talking about? Yeah. You know, and then there's guys that are very in tune and they can look at it as a whole and, and really walk you in very well. It seems simple, but some guys are good at it and some guys are really, really bad at it and they never get you close. They just get you confused. I, I think finding that common point of interest first. So if, if, the, if the four of us, three of us, whatever, we got cameramen, we're looking at something, establish something that we can all see first. Do you mm-hmm. see the, 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 the white rock on the top of the ridge? Yes. Down and to the right of that, do you see an orange tree? Yes. Now you have two common points of interest. And you can say the buck is between those. Well, a little closer to the, the orange tree than the white rock. Okay, perfect diagonal. And you know, once you establish that common point of interest that you both, you know, or the group can say, Yes, I see that rock, then it becomes a lot easier. Totally. You can walk someone in if you all get that. One of the things that will happen is, you know, Ryan will say, Brian, you see the white rock with the split in it. And I'm like, um, uh, I think so, uh, you know, and then he'll say, well, from there, and I'll be like, wait, 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 let's first, let's make sure I know exactly because everything's lost. If, if we're not looking at that same and common point of interest, then nothing after that matters. And so you could spend 10 minutes trying to subscribe something to me. But if we're not dead set sure on that first point to walk from, then you're right. Like it's a waste. waste And oftentimes it it comes from the top down. Like it's it's something on the ridge line that's it's like jumps out. It's blatantly obvious. Like between those two peaks, go to the middle and then come down from there. It's usually a, a pretty good way to go if the terrain lays out right. The next episodes, by the way, um, I got mildly roasted for, you know, passing because the buck, it's like, hey, that's a, couldn't you tell that was a, a shooter buck? And we, yes, we knew it was a nice deer, but back to the not pulling the trigger right away situation. Now, when we go and we spot Ryan's buck, I will submit that he's worse than I am because his buck is big. And I'm telling him gently because, you know, it's ultimately Ryan's decision. This is a buck that we need to shoot. And Ryan is like, I don't know if he's big enough. And this thing is giant. And so part of it, though, is when the sun is on these deer or they're in the shade, dark shadows, and there's bright sunlight out, what you can see in the moment is a lot different than what we can see on the computer when we get back. And so we were both, I was, I knew it was a big deer. I knew it was a nice deer, but we couldn't tell how nice really. And in fact, I would say when the buck hit the ground, it was bigger than we thought. Sure. Yeah. You you know, I think that just comes from looking at a bunch of big deer and it it seems though you just had in your hands, your buck, Brian, Brian, that was a heck of a buck, great buck in most, if in most hunts, the buck of the trip. Mm -hmm. And then you see that next level, but sometimes I think your mind tells you, well, could it really be bigger than the big one we just got? Like, and, and it's funny to watch different people that. Well, it doesn't matter what you're hunting, elk, mule deer, coos, you know, when you just have a good one in your hands and then you see another one, you, you're either, your mind goes, that's definitely a way better buck. But I also see it go the other way where sometimes you're like, well, we just had a 110 inch class deer in our hands. Surely there's 
a bigger buck than that. So your mind kind of plays tricks on you, if you will. But again, you guys have been a little bit coy with the pictures I've seen. I don't know that I've seen a full picture of, of Ryan's buck. I've seen a couple like, you know, not like I need that head on look to really mm-hmm. say that's a good buck. I'm right. sure when I see the footage, you know, I haven't seen any of the clips, but I'm sure when I see it, I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, that's a big buck. <laughs> but I, I agree some angles and, and some experiences for instance, um, years ago, maybe 20 years ago, um, I took took a friend of mine and he actually killed like a 130-inch deer and t- high high 20s, maybe 130-inch deer, big, giant, seven and a half inch eye guards, just this monster buck. And we took care of the buck and we were way back on the end of the ranch. So we just actually kept hunting because we, we had a couple hours left. We went back and spotted a buck that actually had double drop tines. We, we had the buck, literally, we had just taken care of the buck. We had the buck, the antlers right there with us. We're looking at a buck and we both are saying that buck is bigger than the one we just shot. And we're both sitting there in an agreement that the buck that we have here with us, that the buck we're looking at is bigger. Well, it turns out our eyes fooled us. The, The body was smaller and the buck we shot. The second buck was actually smaller than the one we had yeah. just put our hands on. So I've seen it go both ways. He did have drop tines off both sides, but he was more like 115 inch deer, um, but he had a much smaller body. So that's one thing with coos deer that can really fool you is body size. Oh, and, yeah. and, and sometimes they can have those real pygmy, small looking, you know, 90 pound bodies you don't realize it because they're either by themselves and it, their rack looks gigantic. And then maybe the buck that say, uh, you know, the, the other buck we shot had a giant body. So the rack proportionately to the body looked different. So that's yeah. one thing with coos that you really have to watch. I, I noticed like with my buck compared to Ryan's, the ears on my deer are massive. They just are way bigger than the ears on Ryan's deer. And so that's really throws you off because when they, when you got big ears and you're using the ears to sort of judge the width and size of antlers, and it's mass. really confusing. Yeah. It's really confusing. I mean, look, <clears throat> I'll just be honest. Uh, Brian set the bar pretty high and there's no way <laughs> that uh, I could live with myself if I didn't go and try to at least connect on a larger buck than brian's we've been so, hunting for a long time and i have yet to shoot a bigger animal than ryan on the same trip it's ridiculous it's like a horseshoe up his ass like i don't i know there's a lot of skill involved there and uh for sure but yeah definitely um when i shoot something uh arguably you could say one year i outdid him on a mule deer archery in arizona but he went and shot a giant coos instead so you can't do apples to apples you know so he shot it, a coos as big as your mule deer yeah pretty much so <laughs> then it sort of canceled out uh my achievement again which seems to happen a lot but at the same time um one of the things i was going to say that i wanted to circle back to was uh when we were l- looking at the at these deer when I watch a, a lot of coos deer film and I've been binging for years on it, when I can find it, usually the, the uh, hunters find the deer and shoot it within that same day, same hours. I, I rare, I've never actually watched a film where a hunter went back one day, two days, three days, four days later and relocated the same deer, which they, the also consistent through line that I see is many of the shots are 600, 800, a thousand yard shots. <clears throat> and it's, it's so I, I think when what we're trying to demonstrate and what we, what, what has worked for us across all species, really even bears, which wander a lot more, still we kind of use the same strategies in general and that that is to be patient if you don't get them that day you can get them tomorrow if you don't get them tomorrow you can get them the next day 
and get close so that you have you can remove as many variables of failure as possible, as, as many chances as possible. And when you'll see in the next film, Ryan tortures everyone because the buck is 320 yards or something, and he can't decide if it's big enough. <clears throat> so that goes on. When he does decide it's finally big enough, um, <clears throat> it never quite gives him the shot that he wants. And then it gets to about 450 or something, which is with a good wind. And he's like, eh, I'm not going to, I don't want to take that shot when we could get one that's a lot closer. We have days. We're pretty sure Surrey's going to be in that pocket. And then um, sure enough, you know, eventually we get a very, very close shot. And, and, uh, but it's days, you know, that goes by. Same thing with my buck. Same thing happens with Ryan's buck. And we relocate the deer multiple times in the course of days. And I don't see that on a lot of coos deer film. And yet I think we guaranteed ourselves in, in, in many ways, there's the risk that they get, they escape us for sure. We never find that deer again, but I, I feel like that risk is, is far less um, likely to, to, to end in failure than the, than the risk of trying to take a shot too quickly from too great a distance. You know, I made that comment on the last film. I felt like I was trying to shoot a jackrabbit at 350 yards. Well, in two ways. In essence, one, you are. <laughs> in, in two ways. In one, it's a small animal. And, uh, sure. and so it is a smaller target. In the second way, it's hard to spot a jackrabbit moving around. It moves a little bit yeah. and you're like, where'd it go? They just dissolve. They're right in front of you and yet you can't see it. And I felt like that with that deer. And so... Anyway, I think patience is paramount if you want to really get a big, big animal. And more often than not, um, especially on a coos deer hunt, I feel like there's an artificial narrative saying, you better get him now because you may never see him again. You, you better you better make it happen because, you know, these are ghosts and you get a glimpse of the ghost and then the ghost is gone. And, uh, I think that, um, that's a mistake. Yeah. Anyway, that narrative I, comes from a time perspective. Um, sorry to interrupt Ryan, but I think, I think people just don't have the patience nor the time to be like what you guys did and, and establish where a buck is working a, a territory, has a scrape line, has does, has a bowl, has a ridge and have the time to be able to say, you know, uh, that buck is worth my tag and I'm going to stay here until I get that buck and not get distracted. And it's hard to be able to sit someplace two or three days and not see him. But if you know that he's there, it's easy to go, well, let's go somewhere else. No, stay right here. Stay focused on this animal and he's going to show back up. We're going to spot him again and we're going to get another crack at him. But I think that goes back to the maturity level of pe that people get in their career of hunting and realize that this animal's I'm willing to stake my hunt on this animal True. and let's play a game of cat and mouse and let's enjoy the process of struggle of that's the buck I want. And I'm going to stay here until I get him, or until the time runs out on my hunt. And if it runs out, then great. He gave me my, I got to see him. And I get to dream about them next year. But I think we come from a society and, and with, you know, social media and with everything so immediate now, 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 it's hard to kind of retrain ourselves to when we're out hunting to be like, let's enjoy this experience for what it is. It's a cat and mouse game. And right now they're winning. Yeah, let's like, see if we can sit here long enough and maybe we get a victory. Maybe we win. But you have a lot have, of times you get your butt kicked. You, you have to have walkaway power. Like Dave yeah. Ramsey says, you know, you have to have walkaway power. You have to say, I can walk away uh, having not shot anything. You really right. do have to have that attitude or you, you, you're right. You're likely you, you, you won't be able to um, resist opportunities when they come that are less than less than ideal 
You know, you're like, well, I'd rather take the shot now. That's not great. Yeah. I think that, I think the playbook that we're, that we run on all our hunts and not just coups again is, you know, having patience. Um, a lot of that patience is about making sure you get that gimme shot. Like we're, we're always trying to show, and that's not just to be arrogant, like, oh, we can do this, but in the end, like after my entire career and Brian and I's career is over, I feel like um, we're going to have far less wounded animals left on the mountain than guys poking at eight, 900 yards. And, you know, this isn't, I'm not saying this to stir the pot for the long range guys, but um, I feel like we, we, we've demonstrated um, that it's able to be done playing the patience game and getting that. It almost feels like a hundred percent shot. It never is a hundred percent guaranteed but we've always talked about the 300 ish. Now we'll poke out a little bit beyond 300, you know, to four and whatever, but that recipe in the end, you're going to have far less wounded animals left on the mountain. And in the end, you're going to have some great animals that you take home. Maybe not everyone that you see, but you're not going to leave animals wounded on the mountain. And um, there shouldn't, I don't feel like there should be controversy in that. There is, but I feel like that's that's really what we've highlighted a lot is, is showing that patience does kill the buck oftentimes. Um, not every time, but most of the time. But like you said, Jay, <clears throat> part of it is the experience that we want to have. Like you were mentioning earlier <clears throat> that we were able to capture so much more footage of these animals and observe them. And, and as we tried to close the distance and tighten the noose, find them day after day, we got to see things and learn things about behavior that we wouldn't have gotten had we taken an 800 yard shot and killed him the first time we saw him. Sure. And I think that a lot of what I'm seeing as, you know, popular pop that's kind of promoted in the mainstream popular areas of, especially some Western hunting is there's a lot of dedication to shooting and shooting long range and there's a lot of skill being developed in becoming a better rifle shooter out to a thousand yards and beyond and that's that's um that's a a uh you know that's a positive thing everyone should get better and better and more proficient and i think that's a great endeavor to engage in but i i think sometimes it comes at the the expense of becoming a better hunter at getting closer at understanding deer behavior. And because if you can just shoot an animal at a thousand yards and you're very, very good at that, there's going to be holes in you. You never had to push yourself to get to within a hundred or 200. So there's so much that you missed out on in terms of the other aspects of what it is to be a hunter And, uh, in the end, I mean, uh, often the goal is to get the animal and both, both approaches can do that. But I, for me, I, um, as much as I enjoy shooting a rifle, uh, shooting my bow, there's much more enjoyment in the pursuit and trying to get as close and to understand the animal, becoming a student of their behavior and things like that, that are much more compelling for me than, than the long range shot. And so it's not the sort of hunt I want to have just isn't what I find as rewarding. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it over and over and over. Most of the guys that, you know, come to camp and say that, you know, they can shoot between 750 and a thousand yards. To be honest with you, the first ones that fold like a cheap suit are the guys that come to camp bragging that they can shoot 750 to a thousand yards. When we have a deer at 400 yards, they, so my experience has been the guys that have come to camp and they're cocky and they say they can shoot and they've been practicing all year and they shoot at a thousand and da, 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 da. Nine times out of 10, those are actually the guys when you have the deer at 400 yards that just fall apart. So, you know, I I think it's great that people can practice super long range and get real comfortable, just like shooting your bow. If you really practice at a hundred yards, when you actually take a shot at 30, it feels like a chip shot. But for me, I think we owe these animals the respect. Um, You know, I believe that, that, you know, God gave us dominion over the animals. I believe that they were put there for us to enjoy and for us to just take stabs at them. 
you know, at a thousand yards is not the respect that we <clears throat> should give them. And well, I think it's it's one of those things that if you can make the most ethical kill possible, great. Put yourself in a position to succeed. You know, my guides, I always tell them, listen, if your hunter misses a shot, I do not want to hear you come back to camp and tell anyone that that hunter missed a shot because that hunter missed a shot because you didn't put him in a position to succeed. You, not him. Well, Jay, it was 300 yards he missed. You didn't put him in a position to succeed. It's your job as a guide to yeah, have yeah. all the variables of calm, everything real relax the deer standing still the deer you know broadside those are your responsibilities as a guide and as a hunter to take those ethical shots i've seen so many things at a thousand yards a deer takes a half a step and you hit them in the in the guts like that a split second so you know we don't need to turn this into a you know long range argument but i've as a guide for 30 plus years I've seen things that make me say that taking a fair and ethical and respectful shot is paramount in, in my camps. And from my own hunting perspective, I want to be able to make the shot knowing that I'm going to make the kill. If I can't, I'm not going to take the shot. I love watching coos deer, especially giants. I mean, I love to look at their antlers. <laughs> There's just some of the coolest racks on the planet. And to see one of these little deer with just all oh, this on them. And I'm watching a, a, a coos film on YouTube and I see just this monster. And then I see the guy settle in at 850 to shoot it and they miss and it gets away. And then they never see that buck again. They never seem to even attempt to try to find it again. Um, it's like, well, let's find another one. And they go out a totally different direction the next day. It baffles me because. There's no reason why, based on those circumstances, you you couldn't relocate. You couldn't just hone in on that deer over that day, the next day, and and kill a true monster, hundred and thirty inch coos. And so it, I but that seems to be an underlying theme with coos deer hunts that I see that are published. Is you know we see it, we shoot a long range shot at it, it runs away, it's gone forever. And uh, we go somewhere else. And yeah, I think this that there can be a totally different outcome with a different strategy, you know, sure. a much more consistent. And, and, and it's just not pretty. If you miss, there, a lot of times it's like, <clears throat> it's like um, some sort of artillery experience where it's like, oh, two, you know, you were a little to the left, high, little, little to little the right. right. And they just keep yeah. zeroing in. And it's just, to me, it's, that's, that's what I find cringy. Uh, that's really hard for me to watch. I really feel like we're doing a disservice when, when that's going on and there's no, sure. you don't have to do that. There's, we can, we've, as we're trying to show, you can do that. And it's not to brag or to toot our own horn. I just want to see more people be successful. And I, and I think you, and I want to see less animals hurt. Yeah. I think we have an ethical responsibility to, try and make as quick and as humane kill as possible. And I think we would all agree the actual shooting of the animal, in my mind, it's the worst part of, of the hunt. Um, you know, cause number one, the hunt's over. Number two, you've taken a life. And, you know, I, I look at taking anything's life, uh, very serious. And, um, you know, I, I do think it's something that is kind of, it is cringy. You get where you see some of this stuff where there's just no respect for life and no respect for that animal. And it's, it's embarrassing quite honestly, but you know, you guys did a phenomenal job in the first three episodes. I can't wait to see the next ones and see how it goes down. Mm -hmm. I do, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to see guys like yourself, um, you know, that have gone on cooster hunts, but you can see the joy that it brings you and it's exciting to me because it's been a big part of my life and brought me so much joy for a long time to so to see you guys bring that into people's living rooms um is fantastic because i i believe coos are you know an animal that that people uh don't know much about and i think they're intriguing but i think they're worth what you guys have put into it so it's it's been exciting to see you guys, you know, 
take the time and really publish uh, a quality piece on these animals and, and, you know, the, the terrain and the experience and, and, you know, what Mexico or even Arizona or wherever these coos deer live, it's bringing that into people's living room is, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's something about those coos deer, you know, I, I am on record with making fun of whitetail. I have my whole life, um, half serious when I do that, but, uh, you know, even though coos are a whitetail, they just feel different. It's yeah. where they live, how they act, um, almost comparable to a mule deer in a, in a, in a few ways. Um, and, to me, it's and the it's, ultimate it, spot and stock hunt. Wouldn't you agree, oh, Ryan? Just, it's like the there's such a challenge. Yeah. They're just the most. I mean, so hard to spot. Like I talked about the statuing of them, and um just the, the challenge of just picking up a mature buck and finding and locating a mature buck is, is next level. So I know Brian and I, we are addicted and we're committed to keeping with the pursuit of chasing these coos bucks for a very long time. But before you go, Jay, I got to ask this last thing because it's, it's, uh, it's so unique to coos deer. We, we highlighted it in the film a little bit, but the blowing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've never known mule deer to blow like this or any whitetail, even mountain whitetail in Idaho. I've never seen this before, but you know, when Brian and I first started picking up, like you hear them blow, it's like, ah, oh, crud, how did it, how are they getting our wind? There, there's no way, but it was just their rut behavior. And it took us a couple of days to figure it out, but it kept happening. Yeah. And we're, we're so far away and yet we're hearing the, the audio blowing and they're just chasing each other and they're just acting you know, all spastic down there. And so what, why is it so unique to just coos deer? You know, I don't know why it's unique to coos deer, but what I will tell you is when you're hearing blowing, most of the time, the blowing is going to come from the does. The does blow a lot more than the bucks. Now the bucks do blow themselves, but I like to get up on a glassing point before light and listen, sit up there and just sit there behind my tripod. Can't even see yet. And just listen because I hear a doe blowing over here, blowing over here as a cooster hunting, cooster hunter hunting during the rut. What that doe is telling me most of the time is that, that she is being chased. And when a buck, whether it's a big buck or small buck, is chasing a doe, more times than not, the doe is going to blow throughout the whole process. So if you hear that, you know that there's a buck. You may not be able to see it yet, but so many times up on those pinnacles, I've been able to just get up there and just listen for a minute. Or as I'm glassing, I start hearing down to my right, a doe. Yeah. blowing i start immediately looking down there going i know that there is a buck chasing that doe now then you have another blow that's more of a stomp your foot a doe sees a coyote a doe sees a lion or it's an alarm it's a totally different sound and i'm sure you guys got to hear it but then there's that excited i'm running i'm being chased it's part of almost like a turkey you know fanned out strutting then they spit and they drum. Um, you know, it's almost like a mating ritual. Um, and then I'll see bucks too um, snort, you know, like a snort wheeze. Um, I'll see them snort and blow at each other. But when you hear blowing, it's mostly does. So when you hear that, know that that's mostly a doe and she's being chased. And, but the bucks will grunt, the bucks will blow, the bucks will snort wheeze as well. Um, That's very vocal. It's very vocal. And it's, you know, it's, it's very easy to think that the deer is being spooked, but in reality, they're just, it's part of their mating ritual. And, and you see it when bucks are really chasing does, the does are just running and snorting, running and, and blowing, running and snorting, running and blowing. Um, and it's awesome to watch. And I mean, I've seen it where you're up on a pinnacle and you can see, and you hear them blowing behind you, you know, in all directions, then it becomes a matter of, you know, like, okay, where's that doe blowing? Watch that buck. Okay. That's a little buck. Okay. There's a doe blowing over here. 
But what's crazy is that blowing a lot of times will attract a big buck to get up out of their bed. So I encourage people, when you hear that blowing, you have to see what it is. Even if it's down below you and you can't, or they're in the thick, like you have to ascertain what it, what, what's blowing and what bucks are chasing her and keep an eye on that. Keep looking every once in a while, keep, stay in touch with them because a big buck could hear that and be like, Hey, little Charlie's down there chasing Annie around. Annie must be ready. I'm going to go over to her. And all of a sudden, there's a big buck standing right there with that doe that's blowing. I mean, that's and we, exactly. And we saw that exactly happen. That's how Brian's buck got up out of its bed was that uh, that doe being chased but by that forky. Um, it worked like a charm. It just yeah. got him up out of his bed. Who knows when that big buck would have come out if it wasn't for that young forky chasing that doe and having her blow all the time. It was, it's pretty perfect. It was, like it was perfect, so loud. Perfect scenario. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really a neat sound. Um, it, it's, it's awesome. It's part of the experience and you actually on video were able to get the sound, which I thought was yeah. cool because I don't know that that sounds even been captured. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed it over and over and over again as we're following that thing off across the hill. It was neat. Yeah, the um, the desert being uh, quiet as it is, and then have them blow like that. It just sounds. It's just like they broke the sound barrier. It's just like sure. It's it just they might as well be a flashing sign that some action is going on. When we come on Ryan's basin, same thing happened. You know, we just been rolling on this hill. We get to this spot, and right away we hear blowing. And instead of us thinking we got busted. We were like, oh, we're like, there's a, there's sweet, a they're here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're here and, today. And then yeah. we sat for quite a while um, thinking, well, we know there's deer because we heard deer. Right. So now we're just going to sit here all day if we have to, to see what happens. And then sure enough, we picked out that giant. And so it was the, it was the, the blowing we heard first. Well, I got to, I got to tell the listeners, you dirty dogs, I kept trying to get reports from these guys down there in Mexico and they were playing a little coy and then I caught them on their way back and they were like, yeah, we did pretty good. And then I was like, send me some pictures. And so they were like, tease me with like little, little, just a <laughs> slim shot of this and a slim shot of that. And then, then I get to see, uh, you know, you two guys, the bucks you shot and, and it's exciting, um, that you were able to find a couple of those monsters um you know and i think the thing is you guys are in a position where you're willing to dig them out and i could see that in the video where it's not easy and you do get your butt kicked a lot but you guys like kind of had this mentality of like we know they're here like almost like monsters do exist we just got to find them and so i'm excited to see ryan's um hunt how it plays out well, then I think um, that's one of the the experiences that people will have if they go on a coos deer hunt. It's really, it's really hard to find the deer. That's the hardest part. They're ghosts. They really are. It's a perfect name, you know, the gray ghosts. They they're hard to find. And we we would talk to other hunters who were there, similar to our time. We had a lot of people write into us as we published these films and. And what we have, what we have observed is there's, there's a, a great population. There's a lot of deer, but you could be there with a guy that has not as the experience that we have and they could hunt all day long on the same ranch we were on and they, they could come home with the idea. We could easily see this being the case. They could come home with the idea that there was hardly any deer there and there was no, not, no, nothing there to take on the ranch. If you would have stayed on the roads. Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I noticed you guys hiking and making a plan to get up on this ridge, to look off this spine, to look. And you guys hunted coos like you hunt sheep or mule deer. You got out and you got off the roads and you walked into basins and you walked and you worked at it. But I know that there's times and hours in the day that you didn't, you weren't seeing anything but you were willing to work into those pockets where not everybody's going to go hike up for 45 minutes or an hour to get up there. 
because then they got to walk out in the dark. Yeah. You and and I could put the, I could put other guys on that ranch where you guys were, and they might say, "Jay, there's very few deer on the ranch," and and some ranches are have more density some than others yes i agree with that but i still believe that you do have to put in a maximum effort in order to get that maximum benefit or get those big deer in the end and put in your time you still have to put in and burn the boot leather and and get up and work at it you know sometimes there's a big buck right off the road in mexico sometimes but you still if you put maximum effort in, you can expect, um, I can you see know, how the results, I can see how sheep hunters would love this. Cause you know, sheep hunting is such a glassing game. You know, you can see how really good, um, mountain mule deer hunters that spend a lot of time behind the glass would love this coos deer experience. But a guy from back East who's used to hunting whitetails on the edge of an ag field, you know, on a pinch point or something who doesn't spend a lot of time glassing. I think they completely uh, can underestimate the amount of time that we are looking through our optics. And sure. I think literally every spare second we can grab just about Ryan and I are behind the glass. Like we rarely go 60 seconds without looking through the glass from morning till dark. I mean, it's a constant scan, 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 look, look, look. It, it's just is never ending. And especially with coos deer hunting like this, it was even, even more time spent behind the glass. And you're doing that despite the fact that you didn't hardly see but two deer the day before. And this day it's, you know, it's 3 PM and you've seen like four deer total that day as well. And we're still not letting down. We're not backing off the glass. It's, 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 you, you take a minute to take a snack and you're right, you're right there while you're snacking, still looking. Sure. And, and, and what we pick up often is just that one glimpse for one second and then gone. And that was the only glimpse that I really probably would have seen that whole day. Um, maybe, maybe he was moving, but I just didn't happen to have my binos right there. Sure. That could, that's, but that's all the more reason why you got to stay in it constantly. And I, I've experienced being on hunts where you're with someone with less experience, less dedication. They sit down, they glass for a minute, and then they spend hours just looking with their naked eye. And they look a few times every hour for a few minutes. And then that's the day, you know, sure. and you can't win that way. You, you literally have to be in the glass nonstop. I always say like expect greatness. Like you have to be glassing at all times, expecting to find greatness, find that monster buck. That's what motivates me is like, you know, how would the best in their sport ha handle this situation? How would Michael Jordan, if he decided that he was going to play a basketball game, how would he, how would he play that game? So when you go out and you're glassing and you're, there to kill a big buck are you there expecting greatness or are you there like just lackadaisical going oh i just hope one pops up right in front of me no you got to dig them out the best hunters i know have the mindset of like they're here we got to find them well we're not seeing them we haven't seen them in five days they're here we got to yeah. find them and you go to the very end of the hunt expecting greatness yeah. and if you do that more times than not, when you enter the game, when you enter into the field expecting greatness, you'll find greatness if you're looking for it. If if you just think it's going to pop up in front of you, it's not. Every yeah. once in a while it might, but I mean, like when I go out on a hunt, I'm expecting greatness and I want to perform maximum capacity, maximum ability, try as hard as I can. And the best guys that I know that, that pr produce consistently are those same mindsets of they expect greatness. I don't think that could have been said any better, Jay. Is a hundred percent. I completely agree. You got to expect that they're there. You got to know that they're there. Um, and it just should feel like it's your job to find them. Like they're here. 
we just got to do the work. Like we, we have to put in the time. It's on us now. We're in this place. We got to do our job to find them. They're not just going to miraculously appear if you're not doing work. But how easy is it to say, you know, there's just no deer here. That was the problem. Then you don't have to own any lack right. of skill, any lack of dedication. <laughs> and any- sometimes there's not. It's and true. But the reality is how many times have we been on hunts where, yeah, the conditions are bad, the density is bad, the area we're at. But if, if you have that, like I call it like winner's mentality, expect greatness mentality of like, I'm not accepting failure. Mm-hmm. We are going to, whether we see a hundred deer or one, I'm going to find that one. And if you approach every hunt, I mean, that's how I approach my businesses. That's how I approach life. That's how I approach like, we're going all in. If I do, you know, fishing, if I, if I do something, I'm going all in and I'm going in to be the best that I can be. And that's my encouragement to people out there. Like just take whatever hobby it is, whether you're, you know, listening to this for the first time and you've never hunted and you like to surf or whatever it is like mm-hmm. how fun is it as humans to be able to just go all in on whatever we're doing give it a hundred percent and know that sometimes it doesn't pay off but if you stay persistent and you have an efficient plan most of the time it ends up working out absolutely well jay we have to hand it to you as well. It's been a wonderful experience going through your service. Um, we have always wanted for years, ever since we first started diving into coups to go to Mexico. Uh, it, but for a long time, I just felt like it, it had risks and, and issues that made it, um, you know, that, that deterred me from going. But with, with, uh, your services, it made it, it made it kind of, well it just made it that much safer to us and and so we we decided to to go for it and i'm so glad that we did and there's there's a lot of people who have reached out and asked us about uh how we went and we've we've been telling people you know check out jay talk to jay um and um that's i i just you know ryan what do you have to say in regards to that? Because yeah, I've, I've mentioned it to countless people at this point. Um, when they ask about the process, uh, I just basically tell them to get a hold of Jay because um, one thing that blew me away, and I've mentioned this before, is how thorough Jay is. And uh, there are no T's uncrossed or I's undotted with, with Jay in the whole process of from start to getting the paperwork in for the rifles, um, all the serials, all that stuff has to be done well in advance. So Jay just has a a very easy, thorough, efficient way of getting that all in. And the paperwork that we had set in place and, you know, so set down there that, you know, the, the interpreter that got us through the, the military and the police and the vehicle permits and all that stuff, it was a cakewalk. Um, that I know I would have never, I would have been turned away. There's no way we would have gotten in there without days. <laughs> Reach out, so, yeah. well, and the hey, stakes. Go hunt Arizona is what they would have told. Me. Yeah, it's not like the stakes aren't a little high either. I mean, you're taking valuable equipment down there. You're you're taking yourself. There there are there are pitfalls along the way, and uh, so you know the stakes can be uh, a little high there. But then when when you've got it all dialed jay and at an extremely reasonable rate too it's not like it's not like this hunt is um is break out yeah it's very economical so you got the economical thing going and the exceptional service it's just a it's it's really cool i I think the coolest thing about it is in my opinion when you get once you go through the whole crossing process the traveling process and all of that I always tell people when you finally get on the ranch, we're not even talking about the deer. Let's just talk about getting on the ranch. It feels like I honestly feel like I'm back in my great grandfather's grandfather's like back a hundred years ago. Going not back in time. Going Perfect. back in time. Let's not even talk about the deer. Let's just talk about where you're at, what you're seeing. You're seeing cowboys 
that are using methods to close gates. They're using methods to gather cattle, to, to do things that your great grandfathers were doing because they're using logic because they don't have some of the, the advanced stuff that we have, say, in the U.S., and they're using their noggins to do things in a practical way. Oh, yeah. You've got, you've got Wyoming. Lands, you've you got these land Wyoming scoping. And, and, sorry, Jay. I was going to say, you have these cowboys that are riding into me that are like, hey, Brian, I watched you cross that fence a couple times. Yeah. Damn, that's a good fence. Wow. Yeah. And they're like, I how see many you. times? <laughs> how many times did I tell you, Brian, that these guys down here build better fences than we do on our side of the border. In the rock. In the rock. In the Ryan. rock. Yeah. They're tight. They're higher. They run five strands a lot of times versus our three or four. And it made it hilarious to try to watch a guy like Brian with these short little legs to try to get over these fences. It was these great. fences are not messing around. There's a <laughs> and, and the gates, like their inventive ways of yeah. getting creating a, a gate um, and a latch and assist. I'm like, wow, this is it, phenomenal. You look at some of the corrals too, and you look and you're like, this is corral. This is made out of mesquite wood stays or oak stays or oak stays. And it's been here for a hundred years, yeah. 150 years. Like the, the feeling for me in Mexico, you know, with the Gould Turkey and with the coos steer and, and the mule deer, like, when I go to a lot of these places, but especially the mountain ranches for coos up in the mountains, which you guys were, you guys were an hour and a half from a paved road. You were way up on the top of a mountain where the people that live there have to use their brain of how do we make things work? How do we make our cattle work? Our corrals work? You know, they don't have some of the conveniences that we do. And it's it just feels like I'm back what my grandfather, great grandfather saw. And it just it makes me feel great inside to have that I'm leaving the city, oh. I'm leaving all of this stuff and going back in time. And Combine then you that throw with in the, the perfect deer. weather. Yeah, then great weather, but then you've got deer blowing and rutting across the hillsides. I mean, it's just something I tell people I wish everyone. I literally wish everyone could get to witness and enjoy a great coos deer hunt. Well, and the culture differences too. It was really neat to hang out with. You know, great Enrique people. The Mexican the people are there. phenomenal. You know, I thought, and one of the things that we mentioned was uh, there was no resentment. You know, we're very wealthy compared to them. They just were grateful that we were there at all. Yeah. They were so kind. There wasn't this uh, resentfulness. There was just all gratitude. And I thought, man, we have more we have so much resentment here in America. They are so happy. Someone who has a little more money than you and and you hate their guts and and down there um they're they're just thankful you're there. It was they're so happy people, they're so thankful people. Um they smile a lot. They love their music. They love to gather as family. They're very family oriented. Um you know, they get by on very little and they're happy. And yeah. it's just a joy Sometimes it's a recalculate or a recalibrate to just go down and, and see that. So, yep. you know, that, you know, the people, the country, everything about it is, is I enjoy it. And like I said, I wish everybody could get a chance to go at least once in their life. Uh, on the property that we were on, there's like, there's some, it looked like the Great Wall of China had been built and it's old. It looks old, like from stacked previous- rocks civilizations like it didn't look modern at all it, it was over your head in height in spots and it it went on for as far for as miles. i could see yeah. and it went over whatever was there and over the top and through cliffs rocks like it looked Imagine literally how much time like that took. yeah it looked like the wall of china yeah but in mexico who built that where does those the, come from the people the people i mean Think about it. If that's their only way of, of, they got plenty of rocks. So they said, okay, we're going to build rock walls in Mexico are very prevalent in Chihuahua. It's amazing. You can almost look on Google, Google earth map and see the boundaries of the ranch just off the rock wall. That's so you insane. think, well, this is, you know, barbed wire has been around for what? 150 yeah. years. These walls were built before that. Like they were building when there wasn't fencing. 
Like that's what they did. They stacked rocks to build These a barrier. Are like intricately put together. Oh, but we were I trying mean, to figure out how many people would how many it take? people because it's like six feet wide. No, I know it's and unbelievable. You see them tall. all over down there, and you think, you know, who did this first of all, and how mm. long did it take? And it like when you look and it goes down the ridge, up the ridge, over the other side. You're like, that's mile right there. That how long did that take? It seems like something that comes from people a thousand years ago, not like a <laughs> hundred or two hundred years ago. I mean, we're looking at this. We're like in this area, like. There's no water, very limited water. It's really hard to get to. There's not roads. It's, it is, it had to be extremely time consuming. And imagine? the man hours and manpower that it must have taken is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like you said, it feels like you're going back in time and we had the whole place to ourselves. We didn't run into a single soul and it seemed like the property went on forever and ever and ever. It was, yeah. it's a special place. I, it shocks me that, that the land is so vacant, that there's not some kind of, some sort of, you know, but I guess, you know, you're in the Sonora desert and, um, what else? There's nothing there, you know? Yeah. You can, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful it thing to have those open spaces and I'm just, I, like I said, I'm grateful that you guys have been able to capture that with your lens. And I think you've done a great job and I want to encourage you to keep doing that. And, and, and maybe it even spurs you to, to get even better on films in the U S and other things, just to know that what you're doing, you may think you're just making a film. In my opinion, I read the thousand comments, the 2000 comments on your YouTube channel, all the encouragement and positivity that you guys have brought forth with your films do not take that lightly because there are people that don't get to experience that and they sit there and watch it and they are literally living their joy through watching your films so don't take that lightly that is something that is very important that over the next 20 years the the spectrum of your work that you can you can hold on to the fact that literally yes you guys are getting the enjoyment out of it but there's a bigger picture there there's a picture of you guys are bringing this into people's family rooms where they're telling their kids they're never going to go down there they're never going to go on some of these hunts but you bring them joy by showing them the experiences so please don't take that lightly because i think you you guys have been divinely placed where you're at to to bring this into people's family rooms and 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 bring the joy to them and you don't know about the people that are having a horrible week a horrible month a horrible year a horrible day and they watch this film for 35 minutes and they can escape and get away so you're doing a fantastic job this is way more than just a coos deer film this is showing life and showing the excitement of life. So when I see it on you guys' faces, your smiles, and the persistence of the pursuit of greatness, you know, it it makes me feel warm inside that there's guys like you that are bringing this to people. And it's important. I think it's important work. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Um, if someone wants to do the hunt how do they get a hold of you if they want to yeah so the more? best way is just you know instagram at j scott outdoors um you can also go to j scott you can shoot me a text or call me 602-803-0223 um you know shoot me an email text instagram message i'm easy to get hold of and uh love to help people out and we do coos deer hunts uh doing some mule deer hunts, a few mule deer hunts, but I do a lot of Gould's turkey down there as well. And I know you guys aren't turkey guys, but I would love to, you know, take you on a great Gould's turkey hunt and let you experience, uh, to me, the, the Gould's turkey is, is unlike any turkey, you know, most people just like, oh, it's just a turkey. Well, imagine being in that, some of that same country and having those birds, just beautiful white tip birds, you know, uh, coming in and and getting to experience that is is really special. And so anyway, they can reach out uh, any way they want, and uh, I'll 
do the best to help them out. Excellent. All right. But Ryan, you got anything, any last words? No, I think we, I think we covered it. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. your time, Jay. Yeah. yeah I'm excited it. to see this next episode, this monster buck. Cause I, <laughs> I've yet to see like a full on, you know, these guys are kind of keeping it, keeping it uh, under well, their cuff, but uh, we don't quite have as good a footage of this one as we do mine. Cause he's, just too far away like over and over again and it it was hotter but you'll see him you'll get a good glimpse of him you'll get a good solid look at him and then you'll you'll also laugh at ryan for even hesitating um but it's a it's fun and the next episode after that you'll get to see him in your hands basically you know and uh And it's a it's a very cool. We can't thank you enough, Jay. Thanks you for uh, coming on. Let's do it again sometime soon. Get on the podcast because there's so many more questions to ask you. You sent me that judging coos deer sheet. I dove into that yeah. and I'm like, oh man, things are clicking in my head now. Yeah. What to look for that I, I I knew some things to look for, but now I have a whole nother idea. And had I used some of those tactics, I would have had a much better idea just looking at Ryan's deer where it was at, you know, in comparison to my own. And I think you can keep that on your phone too and Mm -hmm. kind of have that so you can be down there scrolling and be like, okay, this is, I kind of try and categorize, you know, a 90 inch buck, 100 inch buck, 110, 120. So you can kind of be like, yeah, I think he's, you know, right in here. But like you said, um, there's something about, like you said, that 107, 108, you know, and then it just, it just changes after that. Sure. And so if you have like a 110 and then you have, oh, like, I I don't know where Ryan's is, 115, 120, I have no idea, right? Right. But it's, it's in this, but it, every couple inches bigger than 110 feels like 10 inches, 20 yeah. inches on another type of deer. Cause it is just in a class above just one yeah. more class. It's yeah. And it's those deer, you know, that just keeps us going. I mean, that's what, that's what motivates me to, to, to stay in the game and keep going as long as I have is, you know, I love big deer, you know, I love big mule deer. I love big mm-hmm. coos, like big deer, get me going. And, um, so that's <laughs> gives you, gives you something to wake up for in the morning and put your pants on and keep going. So we all love it. And, uh, yeah. I just appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on Thank and you, um, reach out anytime. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Thanks Jay. Catch you all later right. guys.